history of Paris <clears throat> is, according to Patrice Hegene, one of constant change, restlessness and becoming, and might best be termed a romance, a tale of imaginary characters involved in heroic or mysterious adventures. These characters jostle for attention on the stage of Parisian history, especially in the tumultuous final years of the 18th century as Paris is undergoing dramatic changes during the course of the French Revolution. In the years that followed the outbreak of the revolution, the social and political scene in Paris undergoes a continuous process of transformation, creating indelible images for both contemporaries and historians. One of our most important sources that portrays these transformations that took place in Paris from the old regime through the revolution are the works of Louis-Sébastien Mercier, a very popular author of plays, books, and pamphlets, his bombastic and moralizing indictment of the old regime, year 2400, first published in 1771, tops Robert Darton's list of bestsellers from the illegal book trade and reveals his evaluative stance on the world of old regime France. His Tableau de Paris, a panoramic view of Paris in the 1780s, is a walkthrough of the city. In this work that grew to 12 volumes and thousands of pages, Mercier shows the problems in the seedy side, seamy side of Paris, as well as its quotidian workings, but he also shows its pleasures. He writes of fashion, theater, kept women, the gratification of good conversation, and the pleasures of viewing street scenes from one's balcony. The Paris he describes is crowded and dirty, but also a vibrant and exciting city, home to people of all social classes. Mercier did not realize as he was writing the Tableau de Paris and adding to it over the course of the 1780s that the country was about to erupt in revolution in 1789, although once again, according to Robert Darton, there is no better writer to consult if one wants to get some idea of how Paris looked, sounded, smelled, and felt on the eve of the revolution. Mercier himself was a supporter of the revolution and a Republican, but as a Girondin, he turned against the Jacobins and especially Robespierre during the terror. In fact, he spent time in prison during the terror. His experience has certainly affected his views on both the revolution and of Paris itself. Mercier's 1797 book, Le Nouveau Paris, published in six volumes, consisted of sketches of revolutionary Paris, including during the terror when thousands of people were imprisoned and executed in the city. The terror ended with the execution of several members of the Revolutionary Committee of Public Safety in late July of 1794, or Thermidor, according to the revolutionary calendar, which meant that the, the prisons were liberated of the thousands of people who had been incarcerated during the terror and who lived in fear of execution. Several books in recent years have looked at the response of the French in the aftermath of the terror, and more generally, how populations respond to mass terror. Um, Ronan Steinberg's new book, for example, as well as a more general study of societal trauma by Howard G. Brown. Part of what we see in Le Nouveau Paris is the city coming back after the traumatic experience of terror. For Mercier, the revolution brought about a dramatic rupture, and the Paris he looks at in Le Nouveau Paris is a Paris that is, in a sense, aimless and confused and in a period of transition. According to French scholar Joanne Stalnacker, thus, in addition to representing the shift from old Paris to new, Le Nouveau Paris can help us to understand the complex relationship of continuity and rapture between, rupture between the two periods in literary history that we tend to treat as distinct. The directory depicted in the Nouveau Paris as a period that both preserves and erases memories of the terror through its relentless quest for pleasure embodies that complex relationship and serves as a perilous bridge between the pre and post revolutionary periods. So in Mercier's text, we get vignettes, the sites, social groups and events that are part of what Paris has become and what it is trying to forget. One group that Mercier focuses on in Chronicles is a group of women that becomes very visible in the wake of the terror and during the early years of the directory, the current focus of my research, the Merveilleuse. These were a group of young women who came from many to define the period of the directory, the government that replaced the Revolutionary National Convention in 1795 and governed France until Napoleon's coup in November of 1799. One of the things that I'm trying to assess in my research is how the Merveilleuse became visible both as individuals and as a group, and how they were constructed first by contemporaries almost as a media creation and later as a cautionary tale, as well as how they function in the historical imaginary of Paris under the directory. For this talk today, I want to consider the role that the Mave use as a somewhat amorphous group of beautiful and fashionable young women played in the reshaping of Paris in the aftermath of the terror through the gaze of Mercier, but also how Paris and its pleasures played a role in shaping the narrative about them. And following on Stalnacher's analysis, I want to consider how they represent a bridge, in a sense, between the old and the new regime in this period of transition. Part of the reason that these women come to represent the directory for subsequent historians is because Mercier describes them so vividly. 
the Meveilleuse becomes central to the parasocial scene, as well as to the morality tale that Mercier and other journalists are struggling to formulate in the aftermath of the terror. But the representational work that they do is multifaceted, taking on a different valence depending on the message the writer wishes to impart. Mercier's frivolous and sexualized portrait of the Meveilleuse comes to dominate in the 19th and 20th centuries, so that it becomes impossible to think of the social and cultural landscape of Paris as a directory without them. Mercier alludes to the political as well as the cultural role that these women play and his focus on their beauty, their heedless pursuit of pleasure at a time when others in France are suffering, and their will to reconstruct the Ancien Regime's class hierarchy is the imagery that subsequent writers will recreate and amplify. In their hands, the Meveilles will become a cautionary tale of what happens when women assert political and cultural control and part of the explanation for the failure of Republican government and Napoleon's assertion of control. An image that you see in this quote from Maurice Lefebvre's 1902 book on La Femme Traverse l'Histoire. He writes, under Louis XV, woman was everything. The revolution, the terror tried in vain to defeat her, to enslave the dominatrix, the despot of yesterday. The directory returned her to omnipotence. Now it is she who reigns and rules. She takes her revenge. Circe is victorious. The enchantress dominates the male beast, sprawled beneath her little foot, her toes weighed down with rings, wearing the buskin sandal of antiquity. So the Mavayas, or the marvelous ones, were a group of approximately 100 young and stylish Parisian women who emerged on the French social and political stage by late 1796 and took society by storm during the period of the Directory. For over 200 years, the, the historiography of the Directory described this as a moment of decadence and turmoil, a time of, quote, inordinate luxury and lavish display of wild living and reckless pleasure seeking, according to one historian of the early 20th century. While recent books on the directory have challenged this interpretation and ignored the salacious slant that earlier books lingered over, it is true that for many people, including these young women, Paris had become a site of pleasure again by 1796 and even earlier. People were looking for distraction and release after the tension of the terror. The Mavayus were associated with the pleasures that Paris has to offer. Many observers saw their enjoyment of these pleasures as problematic at a time when many Parisians and much of France continued to suffer from inflation, food shortages, and the rigors of continued war. Mercier's assessment of these women reflects those tensions, as do the assessments of other journalists, but I'm focusing on Mercier's reading of their activities today. The Mavayus came rapidly to represent the evils of social inequality, sexual excess, and conspicuous consumption under the new regime as they flaunted their expensive and revealing clothing and luxuriously appointed homes, which seemed particularly galling as so many people were suffering or even starving. Their embrace of looser sexual mores, including the right to divorce, raised fears about a breakdown of social norms, especially traditional relations within the family. Their association with members of the directory alarmed committed Republicans who accused them of forming a new aristocracy and, re and plotting a return to the old regime. This is certainly what Mercier suggests. The fact that they were involved in sometimes Shady's financial speculation highlighted the regime's corrupt behavior. Part of what I'm trying to work through right now is the identity of these women and the relationship between their contemporary construction in the eyes of men like Mercier and their afterlife when they became a shorthand of political critiques of the directorial regime and a proxy in political fights. And part of that is trying to understand the relationship between the individual women identified as merveilleuses and their group identity. While Mercier's Nouveau Paris includes chapters on individual men, these young women he writes about remain nameless, except in a very few cases when they're identified as a sister, a daughter, or a mistress. And they're somewhat amorphous. He often couples them with their male counterparts, the incroyable. Mercier suggests that the first references to them are in Vanet's famous caricature prints of the Merveilleuse and the incroyable. Um, you see them here, published in December of 1796. But I'm trying to locate the first use of the term, and I haven't, haven't nailed it down yet. The names of some of the women labeled as Merveilleuse in the subsequent literature have come down to us. Um, the best known among them are Tracy Italian. Um, she was born Cabarus and hailed as queen of the directory. Her close friend, um, Marie-Joseph Rose Taché de la Pacherie de Beauharnais, who's better known to history as Josephine Bonaparte. Um, Fortuna Amlin. Um, she was known as the boldest of the Mavius and the best dancer among them. And Juliette Racamier, um, the gorgeous salonier who was married, married at the age of 15 to a banker from Lyon who was rumored to be her father, although most historians discount that today. In other cases, we know their names, but we don't know much else about them. 
It was in the years following the end of the terror, as Paris was getting back to normal, that stories about these beautiful young women start to emerge. By 1797, they're the subject of sustained attention. The tabloidish journal Le Grandeur reported in 1797 that, quote, any man who doesn't know all of the private and behind the scenes anecdotes, who doesn't know the size and the quality of the diamonds belonging to Mesdames Talion, Boyer, Fontred, and Amelin would be the dreariest person in Paris. They became the subject of printed cards for sale, as Messier describes. He writes, crowds of passers-by stop in front of the print dealers to look at the incroyable, the merveilleuse, the fish seller, the rentier, the folly of the day, anarchy, the danger of wigs. So Mercier is writing about the merveilleuse in the context of a social world that is well aware of them and the gossip associated with them. He shows them dominated the, dominating the social spaces of Paris, the spaces associated with the pleasures that Paris has to offer once again. These pleasures include the newly fashionable or once again fashionable gathering places. The Merveilleuse is mingled and danced at the Tivoli Gardens, which Mercier found lacking actually in comparison to their Roman version. They enjoyed festivities at Bagatelle in the Bois de Boulogne, which according to Mercier was once the gathering place of the most important of the aristocrats, beautifully lit with firework displays now. They flocked to theater productions and concerts. They strolled in the Tuileries Gardens, better maintained in Mercier's view than it had been during the most prosperous days of the monarchy. They gathered at Longchamp, which had been a favorite place to promenade under the old regime, and which became popular once again as people came in their carriages to show off and to see the latest fashions. The nameless young women whom Mercier writes about are, of course, beautiful. He writes, here the glowing chandeliers reflect their radiance on the beauty styled as Cleopatra, as Diana, as Psyche. Mercier's text provides an image of these women that is both moralizing and prurient, he paints for his readers an image of these young women dancing in clothes that reflected their attachment to the antique styles that had become so popular, but he also emphasizes the revealing nature of their clothes. The undergarment, um, the chemise, has long been banished, it's, for it only serves to spoil one's natural contours. Besides, it's a cumbersome accoutrement, and the silken flesh-colored corset which clings to the waist leaves nothing to the imagination, but allows one to discover all the secret charms. His gaze lingers on a merveilleuse whose charms are barely concealed. A shift of transparent linen reveals both the legs and thighs encircled by rings of gold and diamonds. A crowd of young people surround her, speaking with debauched joy. The brazen young woman seems to hear nothing. Still, the merveilleuse is audacious and it is possible for us to behold the ancient dances of the daughters of Laconia. There remains so little to take off that I do not know whether true modesty would benefit from the removal of the transparent veil. The flesh-colored trousers tight against the skin provoke the imagination and reveal only the most secret shapes and charms, and there we see the days which follow those of Robespierre. More than any image of these young women, that of their scandalous clothing is the one that later writers will emphasize, and I find it revealing how often Massier contrasts the licentiousness of the error he's observing with the bloody puritanism of Robespierre, in essence blaming Robespierre for the period of debauchery that follows the reign of terror. So what are the origins of these women and what social class do they represent? Mercier the Republican makes it clear that the Merveilleuses are not women of the people in their expensive clothing and diamond rings on their fingers and toes. Here, his Republican sympathies emerge in his critique as he suggests among them a will to return to the old regime. But in the style of these beautiful balls, the noble tone of the ancient paladins is revived, the knight and the lady. Whereas at the people's dances, one says, the citizen and the citizeness. It is well understood that the advertisements for the most elegant balls can only be written according to aristocratic idiom. It's very simple, and our Incredibles and our Merveilleuses could not enter a ball of citizens. Buy, that would stink of the Republic. Like the aristocrats of old, the Merveilleuses are, in Mercier's moralizing commentary, women who focus on their own pleasures, but with this, they have a certain coarseness that suggests that they are not as well-bred as the old aristocrats. He mocks how they gorge themselves on food at these elite balls, much easier to enjoy in the new fashions. The concert is ended, the suppers begin, where the women, who no longer suffer from the discomfort of corsets that used to squeeze them tightly, can eat as much as they want. They acquit themselves admirably. They devour the turkeys with truffles, the anchovy pâtés. They eat for the annuity collector, for the soldier, for the clerk, for each employee of the Republic, and all the while they eat, they speak dreadfully ill of the Republic. Still, despite their disdain for the Republic of the Directory, it is their connection to the very government that is providing them with the comforts of life. However, the women who curse this appalling Republican regime are the daughters, sisters, wives of its suppliers. 
they don't stop eating. They no longer drink wine because of the frailness of their nerves, but they gulp Kirschwasser, Maraskin, and all the liqueurs from the islands. And like the aristocrats of old, they have little care for those who are suffering as they enjoy the pleasures of Paris. Um, they provide a superficial gloss over the wretchedness that continues to grip the French capital. At these balls, at these concerts, the tree of luxury of opulence blooms in the midst of a city of miserable people. And thus we see a superb orange tree that springs from a painted crate filled with manure. The Merveilleux's aristocratic impulses and heedless attachment to life's pleasures in the midst of national distress is problematic, Mercier suggests, because these elegant women are linked with the nation's politicians and elite, a tacit acknowledgement of the political influence they wield. This is a point that would later be picked up on by 19th century writers such as the Goncourt brothers. Mercier makes his point in a malicious dialogue he presents as overheard amidst the festivities. The gathering becomes a den of slander, but more insolent than malicious. It degenerates into platitudes, into a torrent of coarse insults. One says to a companion, all these women you see, yes, they're kept by deputies. You think? That one with the lively eyes and the trim, trim figure, she's a mister, the mistress of Raffron. That lady showing her bosom covered with diamonds, she's the sister of Guillaume. His last motion was paid for by the crown jewels. That slender blonde, she's the youngest daughter of Inard, who put aside 100,000 AQ for her dowry. She's getting married tomorrow. There is not, you see, one member of the legislature who doesn't have two or three women here whose dresses each cost the Republic a chunk of its properties. Despite their connections to powerful men, Mercier doesn't suggest that these women try to influence domestic or foreign policy. Rather, he lingers on the fact uh, that their beauty and their graces draw the attention of men away from politics and towards the pleasures that Paris has to offer. The new millionaires are still more indifferent to politics, but no less enraged by the government. They make it their primary concern to be with the princesses of the day at the concerts of Gara, called by Ribier Theater, the modern Orpheus. These upstarts know nothing of music, but they fervently applaud the singers cooing and they admire the women adorning the boxes. Here, we see the early scripting of the narrative that will come to dominate about the directory the corrupt and licentious nouveau riche partaking of Paris's pleasures, lacking Republican virtue, making it possible, even desirable, for Napoleon to move in and assert authority over a decadent country whose elite are under the control of women. In a way, this is a revival of a narrative that had been potent under the old regime as the mistresses of Louis XV and the Austrian wife of Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, purportedly controlled the realm. This storyline of feminine control, a through line from the pre-revolutionary period, finds new potency under the directory and will serve as an indictment of it in the years that follow. Raucous pleasures, women are in their element in the midst of your turmoil. They are content with their position despite their appalling outbursts against the current moment. They have never enjoyed such license among any people. Jacobite brutality lapses even before those not wearing the cocard. They danced, drank, ate, have cheated on three or four admirers from the opposing party with an ease and a frankness that would make you think that our century no longer requires the slightest nuance of hypocrisy or dissimulation, and that it is below us to redress our habits and our tastes, whatever they are. Mercier's pages fairly drip with disdain. This critique of the fundamental anti-republicanism of the new elite is a powerful one in Mercier, and something I want to follow up on as I further investigate the political activities of these women, because once you move in from Mercier's telescope view, it's clear that a number of specific women identified with the Merveilleuse, as opposed to the larger anonymous group that he critiques, are in fact quite politically aware, and they represent a spectrum of political views beyond a will to return to the structures of old regime France. But to recognize that would undercut Mercier's larger critique of the depoliticization of the people of Paris, the turn against republicanism, the fact that Parisians, and especially these privileged young women, are focused instead on assuaging the trauma they faced during the terror by mindless dancing and the pursuit of pleasure. He seems incredulous that they would have forgotten that trauma so quickly. He writes, who would have said, seeing these rooms gleaming with lights and these women with bare feet, their toes adorned with diamonds, that were emerging from the terror? On the other hand, Mercier suggests that perhaps it is better that the Parisians not get involved in politics because things quickly go wrong when they do. Parisians, my dear Parisians, dance or go to mass, go to mass or dance, even dance and go to mass at the same time. But for God's sake, don't get involved in politics because when you are political, you fall into the worst traps available to you. 
We follow the advice of a few scoundrels on the path to anarchy or anarchic dissolution. Dance, I beg of you, for you could not possibly have a disposition that suits you better. Hey, wouldn't it have been better had you been dancing on May 31st and June 2nd and on the 4th of Prairial and on the 15th of Vendemier? Here he's alluding to traumatic days in the recent political history of Paris. A political man himself, Mercier seems to have decided that Parisians are better off ignoring politics and focusing on their pleasures, perhaps because he identifies them with both the rabble of Paris who rallied to Robespierre during the terror, but also with these hedonistic women who now hold the men of the city in their hands. It is an attitude that will make it easier for Napoleon to assert his control over the city in 1799, to reduce Paris to a political nullity, and to dislodge women from a position of genuine influence. Thank you.